I do want to welcome you once more to now a full day of thinking around making time across gallery, stage, and screen. Uh, I also wanted to uh, draw your attention not only to um, our, the program here, but also here at the back, we have a few suggestions for related activities that are happening around campus uh, 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 in the Berkeley Art Museum, uh, at, the, at the Berkeley Dance Project tonight, and, and other activities that we encourage you to go to uh, in your spare time. All right. so. Last night, we heard from Sabina Breitweiser and from uh, Andrew Weiner, uh, who I think launched us off wonderfully thinking across media, uh, across a range of histories, and also across a range of theoretical paradigms when it comes to uh, uh, th thinking about what it means to uh, join different kinds of temporal forms, what it means for certain forms that didn't understand themselves to be durational to be made so. And Today, we're going to continue that, that line of reflection um, by focusing on some more um, uh, micro subtopics. And to start us off, the, the first panel this morning will be thinking particularly about performance in an art world context. Uh, uh, Laura Richard will be moderating. Uh, Larry Rinder will be giving a response. And we'll be welcoming two, if we can, get the whole panel up, Rebecca Schneider, of Brown University, Peter Ta Taubit uh, from MCA Chicago, Malik Gaines uh, from My Barbarian and Hunter College. So if you can join me in welcoming this illustrious group to the table, we'll begin. Um, well, it doesn't matter. Maybe if you can wave as I introduce you, we'll know who's who. So good morning. Um, I'm Laura Richard. And as a UC Berkeley graduate student in art history, whose research includes film and performance, it's a particular pleasure for me to be introducing our symposium's first panel. Performance in the art world brings together speakers from two universities and two museums to share their critical insights, practical experiences, and creative practices that relate to and reflect the increasing overlap between performance and visual arts. Our first panelist, Rebecca Schneider, the woman at the table. <laughs> has written extensively on theater and performance practices that stretch the accepted borders around media, including performance art, photography, architecture, and performative everyday life. She is currently chair and professor in the Department of Theater Arts and Performance Studies, as well as professor in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Brown University, where she teaches theater history as well as visual culture and performance studies. Rebecca's most recent book, Performing Remains, Art and War in Times of Theatrical Reenactment, was published by Routledge in 2011. A curator and manager, an arts manager for over 25 years, Peter Taub, who also has a background in music and photography, has developed and produced numerous art, artist-centered projects. Currently, Peter directs the Performing Arts Program at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, which not only presents and develops cross-disciplinary performances in dance, theater, and music, but also engages audiences with artists around the creative process. Malik Gaines is Assistant Professor of Art at Hunter College in New York, as well as Curator at Large at LAX Art in Los Angeles. His exhibitions and writing focus on the politics of representation and include monographic texts on Andrea Bowers, Mark Bradford, and Glenn Ligon. Malik is also a member of the art, art collective My Barbarian, whose international performances bring theatricality to the critique of cultural sites, playfully reenacting the histories that have shaped the present moment of performance. Our panel's respondent, Larry Rinder, is director of our generous host, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. He has held positions at the Museum of Modern Art, the Walker Art Center, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, where he was chief curator of the 2002 Biennial. 
Larry was the founding director of the Wattis Institute for Contemporary Arts at the California College of Arts in San Francisco, where he also served as dean. In the mid-90s, uh, Larry put together a series of programs uh, in collaboration with Cal Performances he, that took place here at the Berkeley Art Museum. Um, and the title of that series was Off the Walls, and it included uh, performances by Bill T. Jones, Karen Finley, and Trisha Brown. Um, and the series he initiated when arriving here as director three years ago uh, that take place on Friday nights called Late, Late night? Is that what it's called? Like? Late. 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 Um, those also sort of have an echo to off the wall in that they include poetry, dance, music, and a variety of um, different activities that bring audiences together. A basic goal of today's conversation is to explore the perceived differences between a performative artwork and a performance. How is each posi positioned, received, and evaluated when presented in a gallery? How is that different from when they are performed on a stage? Our panelists may reflect on, on how um, the increase in performative artworks has shaped academic curricula and departments, as well as the programming, missions, and physical commitments of museums and performing arts centers. In turn, we might ask, in what ways have inst institutional agendas and day-to-day -day operations responded to the demand for and demands of performative practices? We will also hear about how performative works live on after the event. Do art journals and visual art textbooks adequately cover performance in its ma various manifestations? Does such writing usually account for the precedents, frameworks, and theories of performance as a discipline? In considering these and other questions, our panelists will reveal the new critical languages and practical skills they have acquired in order to describe, contextualize, exhibit, promote, and perhaps problematize performance in the art world. So Rebecca, I think we'll start with you. Thank you very much, Laura, and thanks to Shannon uh, as well um, for her amazing collegiality over the years. Um, and and I, I feel like uh, I'm not really going to do anything I was asked to do. <laughs> or we, <laughs> so we'll see, because I'm on East Coast time, and, and I woke up at 4, and um, well, you'll see what happened. <laughs> um, but I've rewritten, I've written something that only exists on the computer. And I've called it the Patinal Live. Um, I'll start by saying what Shannon said in her introduction, um, because I think it was very true last night for those of you who weren't there, that this talk, my talk, will only illustrate that it is very difficult to understand each other across our disciplines. Shannon said that she had invited the, quote, usual suspects, end quote, to sit at tables across from each other. I am then a usual suspect from performance studies, and I, um, as a usual suspect, will speak from my perspective of theater and performance, or what the British call live art. Arts. And as a usual suspect, I will strut and fret theater history out onto the table, trying to pass as skilled. I am expected to say what I usually say, and I will hear as well. Um, what I was happy to think about last night is that usual suspects are usual because they must get away with their crimes repeatedly. Yes. <laughs> now, I'm not used to giving talks on the computer, so I'm having to scroll down. I hope this won't be a problem. As a theater criminal, I will begin by putting someone else's words in my mouth. Here is the opening by Malik Gaines on this panel on the blog for this conference, quote, visual art and performance art are in a classic bad relationship. Art stays for the sex, the good times, the feeling of being alive. But art will belittle performance in public and call it late at night but won't let it stay over, doesn't really believe what performance does is valuable. Art's esteemed family only barely tolerates the relationship. Performance stays with its more powerful partner for the money, for the stature, the trips to Europe, for... <laughs> for feeling like it belongs to something, for fear of having to go back to that old senile boyfriend, the theater. <laughs> How else can it support itself? But performance never feels like it really belongs in arts world. Arts world. It's always using the wrong fork at dinner." End quote. 
If I had time, I would have searched on YouTube to see if anyone captured Lady Gaga's visit to Marina Abramovic's at The Artist is Present. Lady Gaga of Trapped in a Bad Relationship, having been an undergrad at Tisch School of the Arts at NYU, where performance studies also grew to something resembling maturity, even if without the outfits. If I'd have time, I say, because I was so inspired by Sabina Breitweiser's lecture last night that I completely ditched what I was going to say and instead wrote something this morning to share with you. Shannon had asked me to share with you the key points in Performing Remains, a book that I wrote that came out last year. Because that book is all about time, theatricality, and its subject is reenactment. Um, here it is. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's already in the archive. That is, it has been acquired by many libraries and is collected there, so you can go and read it. If you want it for free, you can't have it. Um, you can acquire it yourself for your own collection and polish it off there. Instead of doing what I was asked, which is to, uh, um, uh, instead of doing what I was asked, I've been inspired to write something else to take place here live. It is, I warn you in advance, degenerate and bubbling with random asides, as if the actor delivering the th through line had gotten drunk or not quite memorized her lines or had some issue with the director or the curator or the artist who had outsourced her or she had otherwise strayed from the script, a script which, anyway, was clearly unfinished and lacked character development. I warn you, that is, that it is bad, which is to say that it is theater, which, please, we all agree is just usually bad. And I mean, I believe that, which is to say that it is live, which is to say that it is dead. And here I'll quote Malik again, quote, <laughs> Performance is older than it looks, much older than the infantilized position imagined by art, end quote. It's so old, we might say, that it is dead, if it were not for the fact that it occurs live. Live theater has long imagined itself to be dead. Cinema was said to have killed it after a precedent slaying by photography. Its modernist visionaries of note, think Zola, Stanislavski, and Artaud, constantly decried the habit of theater's own conventions to strangle it from within. Theater, it appears, has long been its own voracious parasite and the source of its own perpetual ruin. Any artwork that traffics in theater or the theatrical, which is not the same as the performance or the performative, can be ruined by that traffic or, worse by some accounts, can be traffic in ruin. We can track a persistent investment in theater's ruin value, running through visual art history as well. It's the decay we love to hate, the decay that just won't quit, a decay, the theatrical, tinged always with the feminine, the queer, the undead. It's a, de it's a decay that sells. Depreciation is evil, yes, but it promotes circulation. I loved, and that's an affect-laden word, but I study the stage, so excuse my exuberance. I loved that Sabina Breitweiser began her Regents lecture with Michael Fried, because it's one place we come together. More and more, I feel that Fried is largely right about everything. I used to vehemently dis disagree with him, but that was before I was repeatedly invited to speak at art museums, such as the Guggenheim, and now I'm a professor in the Department of Art History at Brown, um, so I'm truly schizoid. And despite the fact that the results of Fried's attitude toward theater uh, are, uh, uh, provoke him toward an anti-theatricality, I have a different reaction. I agree with him, but want to join the clowns rather than banish them. And indeed, so has seemingly the entire art world, as if Fried's accidental invitation were, were, uh, was an accidental invitation to a flash mob or a zombie apocalypse. So I'll join Sabina and re-say what she said, saying it through him again, quote, art degenerates as it approaches the conditions of theater, end quote. Yes, I say now, fully agreeing, it does. In some ways, this is to say that liveness, that the live, is a degeneration machine. The, the live is ruin and of ruin, as ruin and through ruin. And I do not mean this because time ruins, but because theatrical time, which is time out of linear joint, ruins all things pristine, original, and ideal. We are invited at this moment, then, to really think and think critically about the ruin value of the live. That's a scary term, of course, taken from Albert Speer, who coined it for Hitler. But uh, the question is, what does the live preserve as ruin? 
Sabina discussed briefly in the question and answer session that works by which uh, she's w talking about live actions, acquire a certain patina if they are uh, collected correctly. From my disciplinary perspective, I had to pause patina. Um, uh, maybe this is what Shannon meant by an awkward disciplinary moment, because I had never heard the word patina used before in reference to the preservation of performance, and I find it wildly compelling. When Andrew we uh, Weiner asked what gives the patina to live er art, she answered history, meaning not only time, I suppose, but careful preservation, a certain kind of time. So I looked up the word patina this morning. One, a green or brown film on the surface of bronze or similar metals produced by oxidation over a long period. Two, a gloss or sheen on wooden furniture produced by age or polishing. I like that it's a film on the surface of an object. Patina, like a parasite, is already intermedial, but perhaps film scholars can speak to this more knowledgeably. <laughs> Sorry, it was like five in the morning this morning. <laughs> to acquire a patina is to be filmed, and indeed, for a long time, many thought that performance-based work only survived if it was filmed or photographed. For a long time, that is. We thought that performance was essentially in and of and through disappearance. And note here that dis disappearance is classically opposed to ruin. Um, which I, I'd like to think about a more by saying that the live is ruined or that, that's saying a different thing than that, than that live disappears. And I'm really interested in that um, problematic. Um, <clears throat> so for a long time, we thought that performance was essentially in and of and through disappearance, instantly disappearing in a now that could never have recourse to duration beyond the preservation machine of celluloid for the archive. Performance or live actions were not the same as film, but could nevertheless not remain but for the film or other artifacts houseable in, the hou in houses of collection. This is now perhaps changing with a spate of reenactments in museal houses of collection, but much remains to be debated about body-to-body -body transmission and exactly uh, what we make of body-to-body -body transmission for whom, when, and where. So. Um, I digress, I say. Uh, apologies, this is the topic of my book, so read it if you want to know why I think that disappearance is a limiting perspective on performance. Again, my book is in the archive and for sale. <laughs> now, from my perspective as a theater criminal, I thought last night about the question this way. What then is the patina of the live other than film and photography? Is the live itself a kind of patina, or can it acquire or grow a patina that is of it and not separate from it? What is the patina of liveness? Is liveness itself a patina that grows on the surface of an artifact? Is the live the patina that accrues to art, otherwise known as objects? From a theater perspective, what uh, um, uh, the question of does the live bear patina, I think um, the answer can be yes. Uh, actions can bear patina. In fact, in the edifice of theater, the mainstream night after night productions in American regional theaters of Shakespeare or the Greeks or Mamma Mia might be called the patina live. The live congealed, Brecht would say, into a commodity, the commodity of the live. And the patent alive is something art actions mid-century, think of Judson shirts, think of living theater, think of happenings, think of fluxes, something that, uh, the patent alive is something mid-century uh, works worked to get away from, getting out of the theater and getting out of museums getting away from patina, uh, or uh, what Brecht might have uh, called culinary. So here we are now in the 21st century asking the 20th century performance work to acquire patina, almost to grow into theater, against their original efforts, of course. Um, we saw it happen to Dada, so it should be no surprise. But asking performance-based mid-century work that imagined, it, that works that imagined themselves falsely or not disappearing to now grow a patina is a very odd way to think about it, if a compelling way. The word acquire is also odd from the performance studies or theater history angle. From my discipline, one doesn't acquire an evening in the theater or acquire attendance at a dance event or acquire the witnessing of an art action. Uh, theater, that raving slut, as W.B. Yeats might say, sells actions but does not acquire them, which is interesting to think about further in terms of the disjoint that's going on now between our two houses, in which theater mounts and sells actions, and in which museums buys and acquire 
actions. But on second thought, I should correct myself. Actually, of course, theater does use the word acquire. One might acquire rights to a script, but those rights are immaterial and are not the thing itself. The rights to mount can be owned um, uh, by producers who then mount the action by virtue of the rights. Note that the thing itself, the action, is realized separately from the rights to the, uh, uh, to the thing. The action is then mounted, dispersed onto those who are paid, they are employees or actors or dancers, to deliver the service, i.e. to perform a labor, their labor being to perform. This is something Tino Segal recently made very clear, I think, in his selling of The Kiss and his, uh, um, in his, his, insistent that the, his insistence that the rights be radically immaterial, no paper or pens even, making clear the performance-based pact of remaining that is the live extending itself outward in, a memory, in memory in a way other than objecthood or imagehood. Tina Zagal hails from considerable work with dancers, Jerome Bell, Xavier Leroy, Martin Spangberg, and this informed his, pers his performative play on the entire matter of acquisition or collection. Acquisition, collection, and repository. These are not words from performance lexicon until recently. Uh, Sabina Breitweiser said last night of Gunter Bruce, quote, I am about to acquire his actions, end quote. My mind went here when she said that. Um, uh, uh, she herself is about to don a white suit, white face, uh, and a black line and take a walk through the streets of Berkeley. Or if she's going to acquire the actions for MoMA, it might mean that she's about crystal-like to wrap the building in white with a white line. Um, I, I, that is, from my disciplinary perspective, it's really quite hard to grasp how an action can be acquired in any other way than through a kind of gestic repetition, formerly called mimesis. And while mimesis can often historically be policed, it's rarely fully disciplined into a fixed relationship to ownership. That's the problem with mimesis. But perhaps live performance from the perspective of performance studies is already deeply outmoded. And perhaps I'm already nostalgic for something that never existed. To my mind, actions previously existed in the commons. They were of the street and were about the commons, the public sphere, open to be acquired, if we must use that term, by anyone. And note, I am aware that, my, uh, that, that any ennui I have about actions owned by, by museums is deeply paradoxical. I remember sitting with Carolee Schneemann in upstate New York in the 1980s and 1990s in her rapidly degenerating house, her water smelling and tasting of sulfur, and her entire personal archive of work stuck in a damp shed, which she had very little fun. So I could not be happier for her uh, up, and include, uh, up to and including her limits, having been acquired by MoMA and will now be preserved. And it was actually in reference to this work that uh, Breitweiser used the word patina last night. Um, and I hoped I helped to make this that happen. Uh, but, I, uh, but I must remark the irony of owning her actions as well, uh, that, that there's an irony that, that her action can be owned as well as the artifacts, objects, and documents that were the flotsam and jetsam of its temporal articulation. As Andrew Weiner said um, last night, and I'm really sure that I'm misquoting, uh, which happens all the time in, in live uh, uh, events because uh, liveness is the temple of error. Um, quote, he said, the critical traction of an event derives not from its preservation, but from its unpredictable and contingent encounters, end quote. And here he was reminding us of the global outbursts of streetwise actions mid-century that suggested the jump and uncontainability of actions, Tokyo, New York, Rio de Janeiro, de Janeiro Vienna, uh, and actions he reminded us that clearly could not be separated from the similarly flexible and widely, wildly unaccountable actions of late capitalism and late Late, late capitalism, ultimately now neoliberalism, in which the very commons in which those actions were bent on occurring were and are rapidly and devastatingly disappearing. In fact, if anything is disappearing, it is the commons. And that, perhaps, is why we began to think in the earlier days of post-Fordist neoliberalism of performance as disappearing. Actually, it was a public sphere where performance can be given to appear, as Rancière would say, that was disappearing, not performance. So perhaps we have to account for the current frenzy to collect and acquire live actions as similarly bound up with neoliberal tendencies toward privatization. If so, how can we keep, quote, alive the inherent commons in the, quote, live work that was simultaneously delivering it, uh, while simultaneously delivering it into the safekeeping of the King's Counting House, the Archon's Archive? 
Sabina brought, right, Weiser gave a compelling answer to this question when the question came from the floor last night. She said, yes, we can. And her answer was, collect it, compensate the artists, and then disseminate it all freely on the web. I wonder if Marina Abramovic, who wants persons to acquire their rights to re-perform her actions, would agree with Sabina. I, I wish that authors would all make it free too, but don't look for my book free on the web. And by the way, um, uh, Sabina, I'd love it if you could sell my book in the uh, 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 MoMA um, bookstore. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I'll close uh, just with, um, there's a lot more I'd like to say because it was very compelling last evening. Um, I wanted to talk more about Occupy Wall Street zombies, but um, I, I, instead I'll just close by the fact that I did also this morning find another meaning to patina that I think rings with last night's lecture. It goes like this. Patina is a settlement in the Vicaturn municipality of the disputed region of Kosovo. The village is mentioned for the first time in the, as the site of the Battle of Patino in 1173 when Serbian Prince Stefan Nemanja defeated his older brother and Byzantine ally Grand Prince Timo Tihomir and was crowned Grand Prince of Serbia. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. thanks Laura and thanks Rebecca. That was really provocative and um, stimulating. For, I think I was up at 4 a.m. like you, but I went in a different direction. <laughs> um, so um, I work as a presenter, and I'm going to um, speak a little bit about some current projects and then look back at some of the um, historical uh, works that have a performative dimension to them that have occurred. And everything I show you is going to be um, stuff that happened at the MCA Chicago. So this project, um, Living Word, project by Mark Bermuthi Joseph with the Astor Gates was something that we presented this past week. I know m many of you know Bermuthi and his work, and maybe some of you have seen this piece, which premiered at um, Yerba Buena Center this past October. There's something interesting about it that I want to point out. It's a, it's a piece, it's a work about environmental justice and how communities of color in particular um, uh, find a, a source of life and regeneration in, in a time of climate change. And so in that sense, it's a piece about legacy and choice. And what Bamuti did, which um, I think is noteworthy in relation to the field of performative work, is that he developed a research-based methodology that wasn't only in the studio, it was um, a practice that he developed through a series of uh, festivals in Oakland, in Houston, in New York, in Chicago, Life is Living festivals, which were a kind of um, field work that gave him the material that he needed not only to feel like he was um, uh, had a credible pr perspective about the, the topic, but also gave him some of the material that he developed into the piece itself. Um, what you're seeing here on stage is um, a couple of images from uh, the first 20 or so minutes of this, of this piece in which the audience is invited onto the stage to experience the performers in an intimate setting. The actual set design by the visual artist and activist Theaster Gates has four components which come apart and come together to form a, a combined house. It's kind of a modular house, that each of which represents um, different cities, each of those four cities where the festivals occurred, and they also develop uh, uh, different characterizations in relation to it. Um, the four um, components and the four actors in the piece, or the four performers in the piece, um, each represent different cycles of, of life. And it's a, it's a compelling piece that I think comes together because it's informed by this um, approach and this methodology. The other thing that is interesting for us as a presenter is that we were able to um, participate and in a sense be inspired or led by the artist to enlarge our practice. So um, on a literal, um, in a literal way, this installation became something that museum visitors could view during um, non-performance hours. Um, Bamuti is, sees himself first and foremost as an educator. At heart, he um, gave a keynote for a teacher symposium through the MCA's education department. Um, we did a number of residency activities with four different youth groups, and then on one of the afternoons of their performance run, um, the youth groups came together, occupied that stage, and used it as a setting for their own um, their own presentations for each other and for the public in a, a program that we call the Share Out. And there were other things on that level. And interestingly, with regard to some of the topics of documentation, 
we, um, along with a cohort of other presenters um, involved in bringing this, this project to the stage, um, helped stimulate um, written essays, including one that was you know, really wonderfully written by Shannon Jackson, and then a series of five videotapes that looked at the process and the ideology behind that work. So we're, we're interested in not only this quality of work, but also um, how to move it forward. Um, the week before this, we presented a, a project by Theater Czar, and they, I also brought this slide, because I wanted to talk about their research methodology. Um, they're uh, a Polish company, and they take extended periods to develop their piece. The piece that we presented, Gospels of Childhood, is a triptych that was developed over an eight or nine year period. They do extensive field work. They go to the sites where uh, ancient sacred music is still sustained as part of a cultural practice. So they went to the Caucasus Mountains on several trips. They went to Sardinia, to Corsica, to Greece. What they're particularly interested in is a kind of theater that is not about portraying a character, but rather um, uh, creating a state of being. And they're, um, they do so through a kind of musical theater that is um, in my mind, uh, one of the most ancient kinds of technology. They create a, um, a physiological vibration that raises or elevates our sense of the sacred. And they do it through polyphonic singing, through chanting, through physical movement. And it's really quite transformative. It's also something that they create as performance in a very um, specific ways. They're um, not at all interested in documentation. They're, um, they constrain the number of people who can um, experience their performers, their performances to maybe 120 people or so at a time, and they're trying to cre create um, acoustical moments. Um, on the other hand, we also um, took this triptych as an opportunity to move through the museum, each of the different um, um, acts is in a different place in the museum, and um, on the left-hand side, there's uh, the, the middle act, which is called Caesarean Section, and that was presented as an installation during gallery hours, um, sort of shown a little bit like a crime scene, the aftermath of a performance with wine stains, um, scattered shards of glass, and so forth. And then um, I, I brought this in because of what you said uh, yesterday, Sabina, about this, this sense of event culture and, um, and promotion. This is a project that we did this past fall with Andrew Bird and Ian Schneller. Ian's an instrument maker, and um, he has, for a number of years, made these beautiful uh, lily bulb-shaped speaker horns um, and uh, with, with tube amplifiers, what he refers to as state-of-the-art technology from 1940 before the development of transistors. Um, and it's an incredibly warm sound. These horns, which are made of um, uh, clothes dryer lint and recycled newsprint um, pressed together with shellac, which is that resin made from the beetles, the, the wings of the lac beetle or the secretions of the lac beetles, range from a foot and a half to eight feet tall. And so this was an installation with 75 of these horns spread through the atrium of the museum, and then um, Andrew Bird activated it with a couple of live events, but he also composed music specifically for that installation, which um, on a two-hour phased loop um, uh, uh, was designed specifically for that space. So um, this is going back in time. It's a, one of the first shows that was at the MCA when it first opened in the late 60s. And uh, um, interestingly for me, I started working at the MCA when they, started its, when they built this new building. And they, there was a um, designated commitment to um, developing a performing arts program, but no clear um, pattern of how that should be designed and produced. And um, I don't have a clear sense of what the um, history of, the, of performance based work is at the MCA, and I don't think it's really part of um, the common understanding there, although it's very much part of the DNA of the museum. There were projects like this, and there were numerous others that you can trace through the history of the museum that had a very strong performative dimension. Um, and so maybe through the next couple of days, I'll get a clearer sense of that through your. Um, 
insights or perspective. So this project, um, Art by Telephone, was presented in fall 69, but it had actually been planned um, to occur two years earlier at the very inception of the museum, but it was delayed for technical reasons. I don't know what that was, whether it was they couldn't figure out how to do the phone lines or whatever. But the, the project consisted of art that was um, all documented or recorded or manufactured or performed. It was a group show of close to 40 artists um, that with um, the artworks consisting of instructions um, called in or otherwise provided to the institution. And um, they made a point of how this exhibition did not allow for direct expression since the artists themselves were not there. Um, in some of the writing that I found about this project, they say uh, the, somebody at the MCA noted that the word art in this sense, in, in relation to expression, is confusing because so many artists of that time no longer, uh, no longer differentiate between art and life and even allow their life, for instance, in um, the persona of one of the artists, James Lee Byers, um, or allow one of their life's pursuits, like the restaurant of Les Levine, to become their art. And they say, as art is set free, actions become art, as well as the experience of and knowledge about them. So um, with regard to documentation and some of the things that we heard yesterday, it was noted that because the customary distinction between the performing arts, which was designated as the arts of time, and the plastic arts, the arts of space, has become blurred by their frequent intermingling, the photograph has been called upon to document and preserve works that in no other way survive. And so as a further consequence, the document itself becomes accepted as a work of art. So, um, the other thing that I, I should note with regard to time is that the artists, and many of the artists who contributed works to the show, um, used the element of time to kind of control their works. So it's one, it was one of the ways that they could, in fact, shape their works. But on the other hand, the institution um, used the framework of time at, by saying that at the conclusion of the six week show, um, they set up a framework for destroying um, or disposing of all the works in the exhibition. Um, except for this. This is the catalog. It's an LP album. Get out your turntables, everybody. Um, and um, oops, let me see. So um, there were a broad range of artists represented, primarily American, some European. Um, there were artists using language like um, Kosuth, and there were object makers like Richard Ar Archwager and a different end of the spectrum, Ed Keenholz or Dennis Oppenheim or Richard Serra. And then there were painters from across the, the spectrum from Mel Bachner to William Wiley and Fluxus artists like Dick Higgins. Um, John Giorno, the poet, was in it. Performance-based artists like James Lee Byers or Les Levine. And then a number of the works in the project were, were actually um, completed by the participant or the viewer. And um, this was, in a sense, a late 60s realization of Duchamp's statement that um, it is a spectator who, through kind of inner osmosis, deciphers and interprets the work's inner qualifications, relates them to the external world, and thus completes the creative cycle. So for example, um, in the, in the exhibition, Klaus Oldenburg phoned in regularly from wherever he was with messages about what he was doing that day, and those messages were written on a blackboard by one of the museum staff members. It was kind of a little bit like seance writing. And um, Hans Hacke asked for a room that had controllable temp temperatures so that you could walk into his room. It might be colder that day, it might be hotter that day. Um, Dick Higgins set up a sound piece that layered voices of museum visitors who were asked to use a telephone and their voice was contributed to the soundtrack until it became a kind of un undecipherable blur of uh, a kind of sonic soundtrack or a vocal collage. Um, uh, James Lee Byers, who, um, who apparently had been scheduled to have a panel discussion with uh, Alain Robgrier, the French philosopher, um, they'd never met each other, and so Byers' piece was to arrange a telephone call with um, Robgrier in which they said nothing to each other for 30 seconds, um, a silence at 30 seconds communication, um, and, um, and so forth. Um, Bruce Nauman called in instructions to a museum staff member who was um, uh, obligated to jump up and down repeatedly for the length of um, a film that was being shot of this person jumping up and down, and then that was shown as, as the work. Um, Les Levine 
um, set up a project in which he gave five Instamatic cameras to, with 20 exposures to um, different staff members. They were instructed to take pictures of whatever they wanted to, and then those pictures were auctioned off at the opening, and following that, the five, same five people were instructed to take, take pictures of that auction at the opening, that became the stuff that was exhibited. Um, so, a couple of installation shots. Um, I was looking at this little red push button phone, wondering whether push button phones were new at that time and whether red was a cool color to have. This is really completely before fax machines and personal computers. And it was interesting to me to read that um, this was uh, a time when people like um, Les Levine were talking about software and hardware. Hardware was everything that you saw and software was everything leading up to the development of what you saw, so the planning, the design, the, the implementation. Um, he was really interested in making events and not objects and he was interested in creating and tracking the flow of energy of those things. And so all of this stuff is, is, has this quality that I think is maybe related to what you were saying, Rebecca, maybe not about work being on the threshold of implementation. Um, this, the instructions that were issued were for works that could be made, but they also could be not made. Um, so it wasn't so much about the completion of the work, um, because it wasn't about art being defined by its physical boundaries or its objectness, but rather the, the thing was a core or a trigger. Okay, so um, looking quickly about uh, at other things, this is a Chris Burden piece. Um, he came into the galleries, laid um, under a sheet of glass. There was a big clock on the wall. He uh, started this piece because he had had a conversation with the museum's director at the time, saying, in which the director was concerned that people who attended one of his performances might miss it if they didn't know how long it would be, and he couldn't say how long it would be, and so he made this piece in return. And so the museum staff let him lie there, there were 400 people when they first arrived. It went on, started at 8 o'clock, 11 o'clock rolled around, 12 o'clock rolled around. The next day came around. He was still there um, the next afternoon at 5, and finally somebody brought him, a museum staff person brought him uh, a glass of water. Meanwhile, the, the administrative staff were like consulting with physicians to try to figure out whether this guy was needed intervention or not. And um, the staff said at the time that we feel, felt a moral obligation not to in interfere with Burden's intention, but we couldn't stand, you know, feel, really stand by and let him do physical harm to himself. And so when they put the pitcher of water next to him, he got up, walked to another room, came back with a hammer, smashed the clock, and gave the museum staff an envelope, um, which had been sealed, and that was, uh, in a sense, um, a set of his, his set of instructions. Um, and him, he said he was prepared to lie there indefinitely, and the responsibility for ending the piece rested entirely with the institution. And meanwhile, the museum staff said, you know, oh my God, all we had to do was end it ourselves, but we thought the rules of the piece required that we do nothing. Um, so, um, a couple of other things. Um, this is uh, the inside of a uh, Christo piece from the museum. Um, it was, uh, the outside looked a little bit like this. It was um, a piece done in the late 60s and um, it was a, the museum was a, a kind of building that was already wrapped. It had an anonymous facade. He felt that it needed more wrapping and um, in doing so, he um, sort of didn't really disturb any of the functions of the museum, left um, places for people to enter it, but changed it um, entirely. So in a sense, it was, it was the way that this performative act changed the way that you approach the museum, changed the, the sense of function within it. Um, on, in this picture on the right-hand strip, there's an edge of another building, that's this building, um, which became, um, acquired by the museum to expand in this very um, dramatic um, performative gesture by Gordon Matta Clark was, um, as it turns out, his final large project before his untimely death. Um, and this act of excavation or opening of the building turned the entire structure into a stage for experiencing the building and its surroundings. Um, I want to kind of quickly go through this stuff and then I want to jump to some of the the current things that we've been doing. So, 
Um, this is a, a piece from um, a year and a half ago that we produced in the museum's current building. It's a work by um, uh, Red Moon Theater. It's a massive shadow show. Um, rendered as a five-story high graphic novel on the facade of the building. Um, it was kind of a uh, public art performance. The audience sat on bleachers, kind of where we are looking up at it. And, um, and it's an odd collision of science fiction, comic book, and spectacle performance and drive-in movie. And the uh, performers um, are using garage technology. They're using overhead projectors um, and, um, and gels. Uh, and there's about 40 or 50 performers inside creating this, this live show, which is called From Outside. Um, this is a, 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 an exhibition from a couple of years ago, or to mid-2007, I think. Rudolf Stingel was given a, a mid-career retrospective. One of the pieces he did was to cover the walls of the atrium with this metallic uh, Celotex insulation and invited visitors to draw, write, and make imprints. Um, uh, over the course of time, this incredibly elegant surface became heavily inscribed, every inch of which was um, every inch within reach. The upper reaches remained pristine and kind of magically elegant. Um, but it became a collective effort of hundreds or thousands of people, effectively removing the artistic privilege from the domain of the individual artist. Um, this was a time when he was also um, creating paintings through his own performative process in which he covered the floor of his studio with this pink insulation and um, dipped his boots in a kind of solvent and then walked across the surface leaving um, marks as the styrofoam melted. And um, as a kind of democratic way of offering that experience to the viewer, we also created a large room with this very plush orange carpet which, in, in which people could leave their tracks. Um, this past, uh, a year ago, there was a large exhibition, Without You, I'm Nothing, Art in Its Audience. I was curious to see that there was a, a parallel sort of impulse um, in the SF MoMA show of, uh, a couple of years ago. But um, certainly over the past 50 years, artists have increasingly engaged the presence of the audience, not only in conceiving, but also producing and presenting their work. And so this was primarily um, a, an exhibition that focused on the way that um, individuals can be involved or engaged um, in that public realm. So there was a lot of historical works. This, this piece by Guillermo, uh, uh, Guillermo, by Felix Gonzalez Torres, um, Adrian Piper's Cornered, um, sort of Design for Living pieces by Andrea Zettel, um, Charles Long's um, uh, audio work with Stereolab, and then a number of um, uh, more contemporary works like this um, Dan Peterman project, which, and the entire exhibition became a, a stage for interventions. Um, do I need to stop? Let me just go really quickly. Um, so this was a soap opera um, that was filmed over the course of a week. Each, there were, each of the interventions lasted for a week. Um, this was a soap opera in which museum visitors could participate in the, in the filming of their own work. Um, this was a, a, a collaborative project that um, uh, used Twitter feeds of whatever was happening in the immediate area um, to inform the, the actions of the dancer performers. This was an audio project that um, uh, picked up unwitting um, conversations and broadcast them to the rest of the people in the hall. This was a, a kind of harvesting project of um, sap from uh, maple trees. And then I know that a couple of other people are going to speak about Echo and Coma, but this is a large project that um, I curated this past year. It was a four-month exhibition. This, these photos are from uh, a performance they did at SF MoMA um, in the early 80s, um, a, a project called Event Fission. But interestingly, as we think about how we work with artists, these artists um, really created their own retrospective. And so they worked as creative collaborators um, with me and with their, my counterpart at other institutions where they did this um, three-year retrospective project. In the case of their retrospective, each of the institutions that were homes for this, their, the manifestations took on different forms. At MCA, we presented platforms in each of their major ways of working. So we did um, gallery installation performances, we did concert performances in the theater, and then we did public art projects. Um, this is um, their gallery installation performance. We also showed a lot of archival material, a kind of uh, treasure trove or time capsule of their work. Um, this is uh, an image from 
an earlier work that was recreated. Um, this was their outdoor public performance, a uh, piece called Caravan that was kind of traveling um, uh, mobile performance. And so um, maybe I'll stop there. There's, there's a couple of other projects I was going to talk about in relation to artist residencies and how they occupy the space over extended periods of time and how that affects the institution. But in general, what I, what I think is particularly interesting looking historically and, and in a contemporary way is how the responsibility of the institution and the, the responsibility of staff people is led by in many ways or Im implicit in many ways um, by the work that artists do and to the extent that we can effectively participate as creative collaborators in their work, um, we are able to um, engage in an enlarged uh, methodology for presenting their work to the public. Um, this guy, uh, Martin Creed, is in the middle of a year-long residency with a different project um, each month for 12 months. Okay. I, uh, I also wrote something this morning, and you know, Martha Graham declared there's hazard in performance. One thing that happened as part of this uh, recreates from a different angle things that Rebecca already said, but I'll just go for it. We were probably in our hotel rooms channeling each other. Right? I already said it. I was only saying what you said. <laughs> Thanks for quoting me, the most glib thing I've ever written in my life. <clears throat> Performance and the art world. I'm, and I'm reading off of an iPad while maneuvering a Mac, so this is amazing. I've struggled to narrow down the focus of this short presentation. The topic raises a lot of possibilities. Should I talk about my work with My Barbarian, which has used art context as a base while continuing to explore theater spaces, music spaces, and public spaces? Should I talk about performance pedagogy in art schools? Should I talk about my dissertation that I'm now circulating into the world, which considered a transnational network of black resistant performances from the 60s that had no need for modernist visual art discourses whatsoever? A way to explore or at least allude to all of those is for me to simply run down my past week for you. So here is my report, and let's do it backwards. This is a stand-in slide from uh, Occupy uh, uh, Times Square. <laughs> Yesterday, I enjoyed the opening of this symposium. Important points that stuck with me included Shannon Jackson's suggestion that expanded interdisciplinary post practices have become disciplinary and that the usual suspects tend to organize within their emerging fields. I agree in the abstract, but have had a different experience, so let's return to that. I was excited to discover Central and Eastern European genealogies of performance that I knew very little about in the presentations of Zabina Breitwieser and Andrew Weiner. These demonstrate that there's always more that can be said to add to the established explanation for the history of performance art. My question to Zabina was about the problem of conferring commodity status on works that oriented their live energies against capitalist structures. I have no elegant answer to this. Sabina's answer was about the importance of inclusion. I would rather see Carolee Schneemann's up to and including her limits be included in the official record than not. And I'd rather see Carolee Schneemann compensated for her incredible contribution than not. This question extends from the consecrating archival power of MoMA to the general operations of the private art market, which do not enjoy the benevolent cover of enlightenment and knowledge where acquiring art is a high-end luxury, a safe place for the top echelons of the 1% to put their euros, and a sporting way to consume. While some artists are now using performance to play with that structure, it's a depressing game. This is a longer story about the power of capital to appropriate and repurpose radical production, and it won't end here. Of course, I've participated in this system by making video projects that have been collected, by showing work in commercial spaces, and should anyone ever care to, I wouldn't object to the acquisition of our live performances. So despite my leftist fantasies, I'm implicated and ambivalent. So let's move on. I came here from New York where Wednesday I did studio visits in the MFA program at Parsons, and Tuesday I met with my own grad students at Hunter College. Here I experienced what I've been experiencing for the past few years in the art schools. There is a lot of performance going on. 
It's an exciting development, maybe having to do with youthful exuberance, maybe relating to the influence of performances from the new mass media culture, maybe having to do with an escape from the rigors of painting or sculpture or other exhausting histories. Whatever the source, many of these students are seriously engaged in art practices that are performance practices. This has also been my experience at Bard College where I've taught in the summer MFA program and where an entire new performance apparatus was demanded by the students last year and implemented by the administration. And at the schools in LA where I worked as an adjunct in the past, UCLA, CalArts, USC, and others. In these schools, most faculty were trained in a different art era before what was described yesterday as the performative turn. Some still question whether performance is legitimately art. Many others accept performance but have little practical experience making or critiquing it. Of the full-time faculty at the prominent art schools, the performers are very few. So my role as an art professor trained in performance is to both approve of and welcome performance projects and to provide some demands, rigors, and expectations for works that had been floating around unfettered. Despite the lack of curricular framework, some of these clever students have nonetheless developed evolved performance practices. One of my Hunter grads, Sarah Young, has been working with feminist critical approaches to Jewish doctrinal issues. She recently made an installation in a women's study center at Brandeis University, reconstructing a rabbinical court that historically legislated patriarchy, but the architecture of which is described in the Talmud as like a woman's body. It is, this installation has become a free space for the women scholars to hold meetings and the like. She told me she wants to go there for a final event and menstruate. Her next project is a proposal to go to the security wall that divides Israel from the Palestinian territories and using a wig made from her own hair, reflecting Jewish taboo around women's hair, she will reenact the Rapunzel myth. <laughs> Here, art strategies are being deployed far outside of the confines of art spaces. Another Hunter student, Irvin Morazan, has constructed giant headdresses that make contemporary urban references while also indicating Mesoamerican mythologies. He often performs with these in public, enacting a very contemporary shamanism, as in a project set to happen in El Paso, Texas, involving one of these shaman characters, a motorcycle gang of African-American lesbians, and a troop of Mexican-American goth belly dancers, as he calls them, who will all perform a choreographed sound and movement routine in a public parking lot. These projects are serious. They are not escapes from the rigors of discipline, while they boldly exceed conventional art structures. I am excited about this development and wonder what institutions will do to keep up with this new art output from art school grads. Museums and universities can handle such innovative events when they have the right staff there to make them happen. Will commercial galleries be able to support these artists? Alternative art spaces already provide a context for these works, but what about supporting these artists throughout their careers and lives? Do we need to imagine a new kind of space or non-space for this work? These are the questions of Wednesday and Tuesday. Monday, My Barbarian had an event at MoMA. We screened new video work and performed a short play and a few songs. The performance and media department cleverly combined a couple of internal structures to make a space for a few programs like this, not deeply funded, but worthwhile nonetheless. We, of course, were honored to be invited to MoMA, where everything that happens is immediately inducted into art history. For those who aren't familiar with Mind Barbarian, we are a collective of three people who have been working together for a decade, making performances that playfully theatricalize social, historical, and political narr narratives. Part of what we presented at MoMA were elements of a recent project, the Broke People's Baroque People's Theater. This is what I wrote about this project for MoMA. Broke People's Baroque People's Theater is a set of performances, texts, and videos, and installations. The project highlights the paradoxes of an art practice founded in critique, which nonetheless relies on economic forces that are worthy of serious criticism. In this time of spectacle and disparity, excess and poverty, the Baroque figures as an ornate frame that contains all of these extremes. My Barbarian performs a variety of styles within this frame, camp drag, Baroque opera, communist drama, drama countercultural performance, and world theater all accumulate into a set of narratives that assimilate too much information. These are just some various iterations of this project. Like many of our projects, it unfolds differently in different sites and times. Uh, the videos we showed, one is Shakuntala Du Bois. 
It is the story of a petty bourgeois every woman's journey through her day and her ambivalent quest to find a job. She encounters a variety of characters who are loose allegories for different conditions. These characters reflect on Shakuntala Dubois's inability to transcend her situation. Shot on location at an old San Diego mansion, the video meditates on class immobility, elite ennui, and fleeting magical possibilities imagined therein. Second shorter video we showed was Object Opera. Object Opera pairs the narratives of historic Baroque operas and communist dramas with an accumulation of objects that loosely perform those narratives. Operating in different registers and orders of representation, the objects su suggest a contemporary accumulation of too much stuff, matching an, an excess of materials with an overabundance of political narratives. Both pleasure and disorder arise from their mismatched combinations. The artists struggle in their attempt to draw critical meaning out of the disarray. So reflective of our practice, this project has produced gallery exhibitions, theatrical performances, performance cited in public spaces, and other events, such as the classical music dance party. Locals can hopefully experience aspects of this project later this summer at SF MoMA. At MoMA, despite the high art frame, the audience was quite receptive to the inappropriate theatricality of the event, responding to our masked play, engaging in bits of audience participation, and warmly receiving our pedagogical show tunes that we sung for them at the piano. Our experience has typically been of doing the wrong thing in the right place, or vice versa. As we've worked through the years, we found institutions increasingly able to absorb this provocation. That's where I stopped writing because the next part I know really well. Um, Sunday and Saturday, we were finishing a run at Red Cat in LA of the latest version of our um, post-living anti-action theater. And this is a set of workshops that we m invented in 2008 um, after years of a kind of contained uh, three-person theatrical mode. We thought, what are the elements of the technique that we've developed and how can we use this to work with larger and larger groups as a collective group dynamics were already very important to us. And we thought about that as a kind of Collective art making is a kind of um, social practice that could be expanded outside of the art frame. And so we used as some starting points that are evident in the title, the living theater, which many of you know as a kind of hippie transcendent uh, theatrical project where revolution is attained by taking your clothes off and doing Kabbalah and screaming and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe in theater studies, this is sort of the Artodian side of the divide, right? And then on the Brechtian side, <laughs> Fassbender's Antitheater which you know has none of that transcendent exuberance and is much more about a, a intellectual critical mode that that still you know is engaged in politics in a different way and to run these workshops we use a lot of um boal techniques which we've all studied and which we teach and we did a workshop with boal before he died and jade uh, my collaborator jade gordon my collaborators are jade gordon and alex sagade and jade did a ma in applied theater where she sort of mastered this material so we lead workshops with different groups um and this only consistent material we bring are our five principles since we were studying sort of 60s counterculture theater they always have a chart and so we made a chart <laughs> and the principles are you know like a lot of our work they're puns and jokes that are serious um, estrangement of course relates to kind of brechtian distancing and a kind of camp performance and distinction is uh, very much about doing the wrong thing in the wrong place Suspension of beliefs is a play on the theatrical idea, but uh, allowing your belief system to, to float and levitate. <laughs> uh, mandate to participate is fairly self-explanatory. And inspirational critique, of course, is a play on institutional critique, um, but imagining it as a sort of positive, encouraging um, group process. So we've done this workshop with 
a variety of different kinds of groups and for a variety of different kinds of audiences. The first one was in 2008 at the New Museum in this, you know, they have this auditorium downstairs which has a very different profile than the exhibition spaces. Um, and we were, you know, after years of sort of anti-Bush um, <laughs> plays, we thought, well, maybe we can get excited about democracy again. And we were, you know, looking at Hart and Negri and, you know, thinking about a, a sort of a, not necessarily utopian, but productive ideas about participation. And this group was artists and, you know, people, people who knew what was up. They sort of knew our game and they could play along with it fairly well. The next one was very different. The, the participants were people in the public sphere who had no art practice at all in this small town in the Alps who were like ski instructors and nurses and teachers, bankers. And so the, the kind of play on doing theater in an art space was completely out the window. And the performance itself ended up being in a public square. Um, so the terms changed very much. And we, you know, when we move around from country to country, a lot of this becomes about translation, which is another really interesting social process. And uh, we realize, you know, we have certain interests. You know, there's a history in this region of, you know, uh, leftist terrorism, and we wanted to talk about that, and they didn't. So we had to sort of follow the the lead of the group in doing this process. Um, we would, you know, reenact local monuments and try and like in many of our projects, trying to figure out the ways that the culture performs itself. When we went to Cairo with this, we realized that we can't talk about democracy, we can't act gay, we can't take our clothes off, we can, you know, like pretty much 75% of our practice was illegal. <laughs> so, so we came up with a kind of poetic, uh, elliptical uh, way to talk about these issues more metaphorically, and we were with very, you know, sort of intelligent kind of university people, uh, teachers and theater people and poets and anthropologists, and uh, we realized, you know, in, in Italian we could sort of figure out how to sing songs and translate some of our material. In Arabic it was just beyond us, and when we finally had it translated, we realized they were making fun of us most of the time on stage. Um, but it was a really wonderful group who, you know, the, most of what we know about what's going on in Egypt now is from their Facebook communiques. And we have a plan to go back and reunite with them. Here are some images from the workshop. You know, uh, estrangement mentions camp, for example, and that's always like a day-long discussion. How do we translate that? In Italy, they said, well, here are a bunch of different terms that you could use, but they all have really nasty homophobic connotations. In Egypt, we didn't even sort of have discussion on that level, um, but we realized that there's you know some very funny local theater performance traditions that sort of match up with it. Um, so it becomes about negotiating these situations, and we you know there's always levitation involved. We've done this just as a levitation workshop. Did it in Madrid with a you know very sophisticated group of artists and dancers and actors from the you know the Golden Age theater in town, um, and so they became very invested in shaping the material and in the aesthetics of the piece, which um, you know changed from episode to episode. In that group, even though we did it at El Matadero, which is a sort of interdisciplinary theater visual arts combination space. It was also on the occasion of an art fair that we happened to be there. So we went to the art fair and to this tent that they had set up for performances in the middle and um, did a sort of in, uh, pedagogical exercise for what turned out to be like 100 high school students who were very excited. And we've tried to make some ex exhibitions out of this material, but it it, you know, performance in the art world. It, this project works much better as a uh, live uh, process than it does as exhibition materials. This, we, we got to Cairo using an Art Matters grant, <laughs> and there you have the sort of mock-up that we proposed, and on the other side, we have what really was able to happen. <laughs> 
I mean, not only can you not just go around shooting things and walking around in costume, this is, of course, you know, during, during Mubarak, this is a different period, but, uh, but they all thought that was stupid also. You know, like only Westerners would be so unsophisticated as to come and traipse around in pharaonic outfits. <laughs> but then we were able to <laughs> insert some of that afterwards. Um, Part of the reason I'm showing this project rather than some of the more refined art pieces is this idea of who gets to talk to who. And this, you know, I don't know how much art should be about the education of the artist, but this is a project in which we are able to sort of expand our uh, set of experiences and our frame and our set of references. And um, it's, you know, incredible. And the last one we did was with theater students from, Red, from Cal Arts at the Red Cat, a theater space. And so doing theater with theater students in a theater space actually is theater, we discovered. And um, there are actually some great things about that. <laughs> um, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay, I think it's my role now to offer just a few summary comments and uh, responses slash questions. Um, so three very wonderful presentations, obviously. Uh, Rebecca brought us uh, a few really rich and vibrant uh, um, bon mots, uh, the patent alive, the ruin value of theater, and live action as a degeneration machine, if I got that sort of right. Uh, I think these are really, um, you know, one could unpack each one of those for quite a while and, and uh, uh, really discover some very interesting and compelling things about um, performance, not only in art context or museum context, but as a, a sort of a cultural and social uh, artifact. Uh, period. Uh, I'd personally love to hear a bit more from her, her thoughts about, um, I don't think she used this term, but I, I read it through her, her comments, the zombie power of live action. You know, what is the um, sort of the, the instrumental power of the zombie in, uh, in, a, in a museum context? And I'm curious to know because of some work that I did in the past couple of years on uh, ontology and the idea of the zombie in uh, Derrida's writing and Marx's, whether she sees any link to, um, to those principles and ideas. Uh, of course, Rebecca talked a lot about uh, the problems of acquiring disappearing actions and the contradictions of um, uh, appropriating transgression into uh, uh, a capitalist uh, environment. So we can return to that, I'm sure. Um, Peter, uh, I enjoyed hearing about all the wonderful projects happening at uh, Chicago. I, I personally had not known of the extent of uh, performance and, and live work at Chicago. It was really wonderful. Um, one of the things that you said that uh, caught my ear was that you were led by the artist, uh, I think this was the Theaster Gates and Bamuti's presentation, led by the artist to expand our practice. And I personally find that to be very resonating, that uh, I personally think it's, it's valuable to withhold the instinct to uh, develop two rigorous frames and categories in advance of artistic practice. The artists are always going to be out ahead of you, the good ones anyway, and I think it's really the responsibility of the institution to, as Peter said, be led by the artist to exp expand our practice and the example that you gave of Bamuti, I mean, is this theater, is it performance? Well, it turns out Bamuti is an educator. So, okay, now what, what does that mean, if anything, in terms of the kinds of uh, categorical assumptions and the positioning within the institution that we've been talking about? Where is the educational uh, dimension of this kind of work and what would that mean to how we present it? Who, whose function is it within the institution? Um, I enjoyed your comment about uh, the theater, ZAR, their physio a physiological vibration that heightens our sense of the sacred. Uh, this is certainly something that we've experienced here in our performance work. We have Terry Riley performing solo piano in the middle of the museum. I think those are, that's a phrase that would characterize those performances. And we've found here at the museum that one of the things that has been especially valuable about our own 
physical architecture is that the sound of those uh, uh, vibrations of the sacred extend throughout the museum and connect very strongly with the sacred vibrations, if you will, of the visual artworks, the static visual artworks. So there is a congruence and a connection across disciplines. Uh, I was also struck, although I, I didn't have time to sort of think it through by Les Levine's distinction be between software and hardware, that software is on the threshold of implementation and I'm wondering whether there might be something in there that would be valuable in analyzing the, uh, the point at which actions can or should be acquired and how to sort of parse that and think of the, the actions in their residue in terms of software and, and hardware. Um, but I didn't really go very far with that. Um, and Malik, always wonderful. Thank you for your... Uh, your, your energy and, and all that you've, you've done. Um, of course, Malik reflected very cogently on Rebecca's own comments and the difficulty of applying commodity status to resistant uh, works. And I think it was uh, you know, very um, apt and, uh, that you mentioned your own implication and ambivalence. And then, of course, it's good to see Carolee Schneeman's works preserved and, uh, and her compensated. So this is, and I think, very uh, correct to say this is part of a longer story about the power of capital to appropriate radical production that, uh, you know, this is a bigger, a bigger story than uh, just has to do with performance and its archiving. Um, I, uh, one of the things that I was left with when you showed the slides of your SFMOMA performance is the fantastic way that your work and a lot of the work that I've been seeing lately in museums and the way that we're cultivating the own, our own mise-en-scene for performance is what you, you call the assimilation of too much information, uh, this kind of excess that you bring to the work that really defies categorization. And you talked about doing the wrong thing at the, in the right place. And again, I think as, a, as an artist, you're in a terrific position to lead institutions, uh, perhaps not in one direction, but 10 directions at once. And we end up being very dizzy, but everyone benefits. So that's it. Thank you. So now we can, um, unless we'll start off with having our panelists maybe answer, ask and answer questions among themselves, and then we'll open up to um, the audience, because I'm sure there's a lot um, people are wondering about, both in terms of practical executions of different um, exhibitions and performances, as well as sort of uh, more on the critical side. So. Can I just add to Larry's question to Rebecca? I was really interested in how fe the feminine and the queer are part of this undead okay. condition. So maybe you could fold was, that in. And it, because I have a direct citation from mm -hmm. Marx in that, I just wanted mm -hmm. to get it so I don't miscite it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, yeah, I mean, this is part of a, a broader, I became very interested in sort of why the zombie actions, why zombie marches. I mean, it's not just because of the popularity of, of uh, you know, the contemporary, um, uh, you know, wa the Walking Dead television show, which, you know, go see it, it's really fun. But mm -hmm. I think there's something more to say about it. Um, and uh, so I um, wanted to think about what it was about the occupiers acting zombie that pushes at this moment in a critique of late capital, in other words, why the dead live? Why, the over, why overt theatricality in this register of almost but not quite live? I mean, these are live actions that replay across their body of the, a filmic figure. I mean, bringing out a film into the live. So it's, it's, it's a kind of opposite action. Um, but what is that, uh, that almost but not quite live that registers the kind of precarious balance? And of course, thinking about precarity at uh, a moment of, um, that's what Occupy movement is all about in any case, the increasing precarity of those that live without infrastructure. Um, uh, in other words, the 99% as opposed to the 1%. So why zombies? And um, uh, I wondered if that was, you know, if actually this idea of the living dead is actually something that we can think about as basic to theater. And so the, the, the Marx issue that you, you, you mentioned, um, ontology, as well as Marx, and so I, one of the things that I started to think about through thinking through Occupy and Zombies is um, 
we can recall that for Marx, capital, uh, capital once it's produced by live labor, is, is immediately called congealed or dead capital. Um, he also, of course, calls labor, the labor when they're not working, uh, dead labor. So you can be live in the, th in the logic of capital, but you're dead when you're not at work, when you're not laboring live. So to actually be living is not necessarily the category um, of liveness. Here's Marx, quote, capital is dead labor, wh which, vampire-like, lives only by sucking living labor, and lives the more, the more labor it sucks, end quote. So I started to think about this, that the, a live laborer who's out of work, um, or who's working unproductively, is dead, is dead is a dead laborer. So to march as, the, as a zombie, right, is to say, <laughs> I'm unemployed. Um, I am dead labor. And you have to revest me, in a sense, I mean, put me back to work uh, in the logics of, of capitalism. But I also, in thinking about this more, um, I mean, because if we can think about it, value within capitalism is a matter of socially necessary labor time. So it's about actually temporality. It's about socially necessary labor time is Marx's words, because commodities immediately once they're finished, object commodities as well as laborers, are a kind of, um, uh, I mean, co uh, are con uh, a commodity is a congealed, is congealed labor. And it's dead the moment it's, that it's born. It has to be revested with the live to keep from depreciating. So another word for, so basically co commodities, objects are little tableau vivant. They're little frozen images of labor. And th I'm starting to think that another word for capitalism is live arts. <laughs> <laughs> another word for capitalism is the live arts. Because you have to revest, anything to have value has to be revested with the live, with the labor of the live. And so now that's coming to, to be sort of liveness. Um, the labor of the live actor. So that's where I'm trying to. Th that that's like the edge of what the edge of what I'm thinking about with this. But I think that the zo this so sort of zombie moment um, can help us do that. Well, zombies are not really dead. They're living dead. And it would it'd be great if right. if you could find a way of um, incorporating that notion into the sort of the logical tree that you're building or tree forward, I should say. To me, the, the living dead have a function, not only to scare us, but also to give us a sense of what it is that, why it is that we're in this world and what, what we can learn from them. So the perspective of the living dead in um, the best sense of the, of the zombie <laughs> is to um, reground us here. So I, I feel like the, in relation to the Occupy movement, the, that, was a completely unannounced and, and totally transformative uh, element that shifted the entire debate in a way that had never ever been imagined through that through the whole fiscal crisis. And so, I mean, maybe the maybe the zombie metaphor is interesting to consider, but I I don't think of it as I don't think of it as di dichotomously op opposed as in the same way that you do. Dichotomously opposed. As of dead, lot, dead and lot. Yeah, no, no, no. I, 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 I don't think of it. I mean, I agree with you. Um, so I'll have to think more rigorously about it. I think it's an undead. It's an, it's undecidability. I mean, that there's, that there's the hauntology aspect. It's much right. more about uh, uh, the undecidability of that. The and in a sense, then the un, uh, it, it won't stay, uh, it won't die, but it also won't be entirely live. And that, that, is a, that is a category that, you know, uh, for us within, you know, our dis different disciplines, theater is often thought, well, you know, that's, those are the live arts, and all the others are the mediated arts or dead arts in some ways. And those are false categories. I mean, I completely agree. Um, to think of theater as live is, is not to think about theater th deeply. Um, theater, you know, within theater studies, there's the, the haunting, it's, it's constantly considered, um, I mean, Marvin Carlson's The Haunted Stage, a medium of, of haunting. And I, I think this is also deeply um, um, problematic uh, in terms of the of photography, of the idea of thinking, in the, I write about this in Performing Remains, of photography is automatically linked to the dead. I mean, that sort of Bartzian idea that what you have in the photograph is what is no longer there. Um, and that is an indication of, de of, of, of death. Um, 
uh, as opposed to life, in some kind of oppositional relationship to life. And I think that, that one of the things that um, you know, we might overcome together, I think it's a moment for thinking together about the, the, no, the no longer satisfying thrall to death on the one hand as a way of thinking about remains, or over, over emphasizing the liveness of mm -hmm. something like the live arts on the other, yeah. that we should think of different, different ways of thinking the states, these states between. Yeah. So thank you for the correction, I completely agree. And this is why I think that for museums, the metaphor of the zombie is particularly productive because it becomes the interstitial space where performance and objects coexist right. in the hauntological model of things that are invested with, that, that are haunted by um, an, an as a lost aspiration, which nevertheless motivates them. And in the hauntological model, an object can be motivated, in Marx's model, can be motivated just as much as a, uh, an animated thing. So I do think that's a more interesting way to see creative work in a museum than, well, these, this takes time and this doesn't. Taking sort of this in-betweenness in a slightly different direction. Um, so you represent museum institutions that are presenting work of artists at a certain stage um, in their careers. And Malik, you work with artists who are in that formative period. What happens in the in-between when people making performative work are um, looking for their next step. What, what do you see as the incubators and the support network that get people out of the MFA programs and into the museums? Where are they showing the work in between? Or I guess, uh, Larry and, and Peter, where are you seeing the work to bring into the museums for the first time? Well, we actually um, delegate the curatorial responsibility for much of our performance program, for the late program, so we're not the ones selecting the works. Uh, so I'm not seeing it anywhere. I only see boardrooms and airplanes. But um, uh, other people see the stuff, and then it arrives in our museum. I mean, sometimes right out of the MFA programs or in the MFA programs, there's, very, there's, there's no gap in our uh, here between sort of the educational period and post-educational. We have everyone from, you know, Terry Riley and Anna Halperin to people who are still in school performing here. I mean, there's, there's a ton of self-organized spaces, and I, I think that um, often the larger institutional platforms are uh, not necessarily the best place for people to do their work. So um, for how we find things or how we create a shared platform, we, um, we sometimes use larger platforms and, and use it as, a, as a, a palette of response, as was the case with the um, stuff that I showed from the Without You, I'm Nothing, Art and Its Audience exhibition, um, where there were 25 different artists from across the spectrum of um, visual and performing arts invited to make work it's sort of in response to it, it was more it was almost like a uh, an open call for proposals and then there's there's things that are much more formally organized and negotiated over a period of several years so that we can follow the trajectory not only of an artist's development but also the trajectory of a of a given work over time which makes it more gratifying um, i think that the uh, the the question of, of an in-between space is just an ongoing condition because there's plenty of artists who are very established who um, one year have lots of opportunities to have their work made and the next year they don't. And it's just, or to have their work seen, the next year they don't. There's no um, consistent mechanism in the performing arts for um, the ongoing support of the breadth of um, of what's going on in the way that there might be in, I probably am fantasizing about this, but the way that there might be in the commercial gallery system where there's a, there's, um, a different through line of support. So, uh, you know, where, how we find artists that we're passionate about and um, where they come from is, it's completely arbitrary. There's 10,000 really interesting projects and we get to do 30 of them a year. 
I'll, uh, you know, I mean, one thing about working as a collective is that you have sort of a self-sustaining community. There are at least two other people who believe in what you're doing, and that's one way we've, you know, we've gone from being a young collective to a not so young collective or less young collective is by creating sort of a community to work in. And we, you know, did most of this based in Los Angeles, which has been very good about um, provisional spaces and placing value on provisional spaces where a group of artists open a storefront or, uh, uh, you know, e even, you know, during different periods, commercial gallery, like small commercial galleries have had a lot of young sort of, uh, unrefined energy and that kind of comes and goes and these places come and go and that creates a kind of flexibility that isn't uh, concerned with uh, you know permanent final results that I think really allows for a lot of in-between stuff to happen um, and I know this you know happens in New York to some extent though the stakes feel a little different and it happens here it happens all over the place um, I think it's important to support these places and the kind of mid-sized nonprofits that are very rare now um, because those are the kind of you know, pillars of the community that create this in-between space. One other thing I, I just thought of as you were speaking, Malik, is that um, in the example that I know best at the MCA Chicago, the, one of the ways that we've uh, uh, are opening up the field of possibilities is um, also, you know, has an organic um, or arbitrary dimension, but that is to say that it's not just um, me and my staff in the performing arts department who are organizing performative projects. It's people in the visual arts, it's people in the, uh, the department that, that we call communications and community engagement, which is sort of like a marketing department, does a lot of events, but a lot of them are performative. Some of them are participatory um, through this Communi uh, community engagement pro uh, department. Some, there's like a artist-led um, group drawing um, events um, once once every, every month. It's called Doodle Ganza. Um, there's another one that's an artist-led um, uh, sort of gestural um, events that um, are based on flash mobs, and it's called Mash Flobs. Those are also once a month. And um, but then others are quite. Um, Serious, um, you know, art, you know, artist projects that happen in a, in a kind of free and open forum. Now, what we're trying to do um, and is to f uh, connect the, sp the uh, spectrum of all these different kinds of things from very formal, organized um, projects that occur in the theater space to things that are much more open and participatory. And with we're doing it maybe because we're, there's a paucity of effective terms, but we're doing it as uh, within the rubric of live arts. Um, and because all those things, although we may organize them from different points of view, um, are in a, in a sense part of a spectrum. And I think that's, that's a more sensible way for the public to, in, to accommodate that and understand that this is a, a strong suit of activity, not only of our time, but also um, for this particular organization that, that provides multiple platforms for um, this kind of live-based activity. So I guess the, you know, the quick answer is the, the best way to expand is to have more people involved in being um, uh, facilitators or, you know, depending on your point of view, gatekeepers. So now we have uh, about 10 minutes left and uh, let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Yeah. Yeah, I Here, wait for the microphone. Is it on now? No? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I had a question for the panel. Um, two of you are working um, within educational institutions, um, Hunter and Brown, and two of you are working from um, museum um, perspectives. And I'm just wondering, I mean, I really like the way, Malik, that you um, foregrounded the work of your students. And how do you see the work that you're doing um, and what can you do working through educational sort of institutions? And are there certain um, parts of your practice that sort of an academic setting um, 
allows you a certain freedom, or what does that mean for you in your practice? And since both of you have worked as, well, I'm not sure about you, Rebecca, but Malik, you certainly sort of detailed you've been both at art academies, art institutions, as well as now you're at Hunter. And so what does that allow you to do? And what also the shifts in kind of um, institutions that are occurring today where there are all, are all forms of realignments, restructurings, bringing together the arts, um, and what does that mean? I mean, practically, uh, teaching is a way to not starve to death, and, you know, I come from L.A. previously where it's our, our leading artists are also professors, Mary Kelly or Andrea Frazier or my, my dad, Charles Gaines, who teaches at CalArts, and their work is engaged in discourse in that way. Um, so it's a little bit different in New York, I think, where I am now, where um, it's seen as sort of a compromise in many cases, but I don't take it that way. And because, as you see, my work involves pedagogical processes and involves talking to people, it involves a lot of that. Um, it all becomes sort of a continuation of the same project. Um, you know, I get, you know, I, like everyone, I have concerns about the MFA machine and uh, how many slots are out there for the number of graduates. Um, and, you know, that's true in every field. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, my creative work and this other work is all very connected for me. And thank you for appreciating my students' work. I feel like maybe I exploited them a little, but I didn't tell them that I was doing this. But um, they, they, I thought it, was, it made a good point. Uh, um, yes, I, I was thinking earlier that, in a sense, I, I'm, I'm a live, my live labor has been acquired by the university. And I give it, you know, I mean, that's I also, that's my job, and that's what I do, and teaching is part of that. Um, but, you know, we, we just had a conference on affect and labor within the university, which, actually, which our PhD students had put on. It was very interesting because, you know, part of the question about, you know, what is immaterial labor comes out, even the notion of immaterial labor from uh, out of thinking about the labor of academics. But one could also say that immaterial labor is also the labor of, of acting, of creating affect. And certainly thinking about this moment in capitalism, if we're thinking about it as a service economy, or some have said the affect factory, that we are involved in generating what uh, Maurizio Lazzarato has termed capital relations. That, that you know, we're conjoined to give our labor for the university uh, as an institution to churn out people that understand and and uh, continue capital relations. So what are the capital relations? And I think, you know, that's, you know, what I get to do in the university while producing capital relations is also thinking critically about capital relations. And that tangle is interesting because capitalism doesn't mind <laughs> that you think about. I mean, you're, you're feeding, you know, you're feeding into the very thing that your criticism becomes, you know, the next commodity. Um, so I, I don't know what it allows me to do, except other, you know, it does allow me to eat and come to conferences like this and engage in fabulous questions. Uh, you know, that's not a good answer. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my students are fantastic. Uh, I, you know, mostly work in uh, perform, uh, performance studies and theater studies, but even at the university, these, these, these lines are blurring. So, you know, in modern culture and media and art history, and they, I've got students in all of those now more than ever before. And 10 years ago, they didn't come and sit in classes together at all. And now we've got the film students and the art history students and the theater students all in the room, and that's kind of amazing. We're just thinking things together. And I learn from them uh, all the time. So. While I'm calling out the artist teachers, I should mention Daniel Martinez and Simon Lung, who are here in the audience. And I mean, it's another example of artists who are a huge influence on everybody in LA. <laughs> Sabina, you had a question? Could you um, mm -hmm. pour me some water? There is so, a thank you all for your presentations. And, yeah, and again, to Malik and Rebecca, a question. How do you prepare your students for um, that their labor diminishes in their commodity, so to say, if the institution will absorb the performance, the performative arts of your students? How do you prepare them for something looking 
what's going on with artworks which were probably not meant to end up in an institution, mm -hmm. uh, or pe at least artists haven't, been, haven't thought about that originally mm -hmm. or didn't care, but now everything becomes absorbed by institutions, mm -hmm. by art museums within these sort of, you know, gain, always getting new, more fresh blood, the newest artist, the youngest artist, mm -hmm. the hottest stuff, all those <laughs> things. So all these barriers, these sort of, what we were criticizing, the conservative or canonizing museums diminished, of course. Suddenly everything is possible, anything is possible. So how do you prepare your students? Is this paradise or is this <laughs> frightening? Uh, I remember when Kabakov moved to the West, so to say, he once gave an interview in Vienna and he said, the West for him is paradise. They fulfill everything you want to do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I think this is striking if you think about the background and the work of Kabakov as such. It's mm -hmm. kind of a thought, something is wrong. You can't do any work anymore. So how do you prepare your students? I would be interested for this materialized I mean, world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, often these are sort of very creative and ambitious people who are going to figure that out. And I feel like my job sometimes is to slow them down a little bit. I don't, I don't really worry about that as much as... Uh, getting them to think about what their project is and what their investment in that project is and what, what, what they're trying to say, you know? Um, because the rest of it sometimes even comes before they've worked all of that out. Um, and yeah, they'll, I, I, I expect that they will, just like I did, <laughs> will figure that out for themselves and want to sort of work on the work at this point while they, while they have a couple of years of MFA paradise. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fantastic question, and all I can say is that um, you know there's a there's a rift within the academy um, on the on the uh, in the arts, at least in theater arts. On the one hand, there's the professionalization schools of MFA that are making actors and making directors and sending them into the in, into the world, um, and the tensions of how to create a student for that and to be prepared for that are vexed within that world about what are the skills you're going to need and more and more they don't really need the skills of the classical theater um, uh, but the, the MFA machinery still wants to train them for a regional theater kind of a, a thing. Um, and meanwhile RISD, the neighboring art school, you know, doesn't have a performance program yet um, and you know the students want to or it may now but a couple of years ago it didn't but it's um, uh, uh, how do you prepare them? I don't know. I don't teach there, but those students sometimes come up to me where I don't teach in the professionalizing wing. I teach in the academic wing. I teach PhD students to go into the academy. So how do I prepare them? I prepare them to do things like what I've just done now, to be unable to really answer a question about how I prepare <laughs> artists. No, because I don't. I mean, I prepare academics. So that that's another sort of in-between thing here that we're not discussing, which is also the role of, not, not the, you know, of of, of the academy within all of these different uh, productions of, uh, of, of, these, of these identities. But the um, academia is the pressure group, so you can say, for the artists at, at the end. Yes. You are writing, writing officially art history. It's your job to canonize and say that's important, that's less important. No, I'm in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> This on? Yeah, uh, I wanted to return to that in-between state because I think actually most artists, uh, working artists, never leave that state, right? And it's a precarious one. And I think what, uh, especially in the states where there really is no money for artists unless they break through into these institutions, what we traffic in is, is cultural capital, right? How do we get the attention of the academy or the arts institution that might be able to support our work with, even if we don't ever expect to get paid for it? is to traffic in, you know, which, whether, whether it's, uh, you know, everything from sort of social networking and schmoozing with the right people to building a CV. And what happens is that we self-zombify, if you will, because what is, it, what is getting an MFA in the States except getting into debt? And what is mm -hmm. debt except the promise of future, future labor, future live labor? Right. So my performance is a promise of that I will pay back this debt mm -hmm that I'm carrying around this, I'm promising that I will have this dead labor that somehow if, if, if these institutions give me the opportunity, I will, I will then bring to life in order to sell, right? 
in order to allow you to, um, you know, but, and part of the Occupy, the, this response is that we are the, you know, in the face of the crisis is there is no expectation that we will even be given that opportunity to allow ourselves, our labor to be exploited. Uh, and so that precariousness is the experience of, of, of I mean, that's why it's called zombie capitalism, right? Chris is Harmon. that it's a, it's a hulk of a system. And so it's fascinating to me to, to, to enter this, um, you know, what is basically, the, I mean, the, what, I'd be interested in sort of theorizing like what the, what, what the affective state is of living with debt and, um, in, you know, in, in debt culture. And I think that part of that, that sense of the Occupy is this, this facing this future of precarity, and, you know, we are the, I mean, that's the slogan, it's we are the consequence. Yeah. And part of the consequence is that you're going to have to, we're going to be facing a future where the consequence of the 1% is that you're going to have a, you could have a set of zombies, whether they're performing in the streets, and the, at least in Oakland, the, you know, the collaborative performance is, is with, the, with, with the state, with the repressive apparatus. We do things in order to pull out this audience, you know, the attention, whether it's from UC Berkeley with their batons or from the OPD. And that becomes a performative space, which is acting out this crisis. I don't know, that's a comment. I don't really know what to do with that. Um, well, I'll say something to, to that. Um, I mean, first of all, I think that, you know, even though I say the live arts are, uh, is another word for commodity capitalism, I mean, it, that would sound like I'd say then get rid of, get rid of the live arts, you know, be, that I'm anti-live arts and wanting to uh, think, but think of something maybe called dead arts. Um, uh, but, but, um, but, but I have to say that if we remember, I, I think that the, the sort of imp one way of historicizing the impulse to performance in the art world was to think of the critique that performance-based arts could give to commodity capitalism, that a performance-based art would disappear, so the logic went, and it wouldn't give something then to exchange. So that turn to performance-based art was itself uh, critical, could perform a kind of criticism of object-based commodity capitalism. So the question is, you know, now that we are, we, that, you know, that, perform, that performance-based arts now, though, in a service economy are in a performance-based economy, where what is bought and sold is affect or affective relations. So then the question is that, you know, what, what do we turn to to critique the affective relations? And in a sense, perhaps making those explicit in the production of affect, uh, rendering that affect explicit can be a critique of those very, of those very relations, that performance itself just in and of itself no longer, you know, is that. Um, and this is where I think a distinction you asked me before about the queer and the undead and, and, and the feminine. I mean, I think there's a distinction between performance, and this was partly what we were asked to talk about in the beginning, uh, performance and the performative in the performative turn on the one hand, and theater and theatricality on another hand. That that, that theatrical work, as opposed to performance-based work, is a different relationship to time. Um, it's, and you mentioned camp. But it's, already, it's always in a vexed relationship to a kind of um, uh, performance. The, the, the promise of performance is that it makes something happen here now, in an immediate now. But theatricality is always off of the now in a sort of citational or um, uh, a temporal drag, as Lisa Freeman says, taking from Homi Baba, who takes from Franz Fanon, to think about the sort of geopolitical uh, uh, and, you know, also Ira Garay on the, on the feminist aspect of it. So I think, I think what's, what's perhaps interesting and useful um, is to trouble our thinking about performance-basedness with theatrical, with theatricality that might be useful for us in terms of a critique of, um, of, of current of affect economy and what it and, and the debt to which it, it hails us. I think there's more to be said, but I'll stop there. We have time for one more question. Um, how do I choose? Um, closer wins. <laughs> Sit closer next time. <laughs> um, I, I'm interested in the your response to the kinds of very, very long-term commitment uh, to projects like, well, you know, Augusta Boal's, you know, deep into uh, com communities and like, say, Louis McAdams's Los Angeles, uh, I mean, the LA River project that's a 40-year term commitment he's made or Rick Lowe's project in Houston with Project Row Houses and that. Those kinds of things that may have their institutional start with a museum or 
by the artists generating themselves. How does that kind of duration play into this discussion? <coughs> Great question. I'm Meryl Ukeles at the sanitation department mm. in, in New York. I can't hear you. I just mentioned Meryl Ukeles at the sanitation yeah, department. Mm. Well, some of these actions, like Rick Lowe's, uh, become de facto institutions. It's an art project. Uh, maybe it's a performance. Maybe it's an in expanded installation. It's also an institution. And it begs the question of to what degree are museums themselves performances and, you know, mise en scène. Uh, so then it gets very squirrely at that point. <laughs> Like uh, Julie's question kind of intersects with uh, something I was thinking about, which that that some of the um, dynamics that you were talking about about around time or around um, certain kinds of collaboration could, could could occur under a term like performance. And this panel is is titled "Performance in the Art World," so it's appropriate we're talking about it as performance. But these other kinds of long durational work. Um, often go under a different kind of term. They aren't, it isn't necessarily that the performance term would be the label that you would use to organize it. It might be um, something around social practice or, um, or a, a public art practice. Um, and, and, um, and yet, at the same time, it seems that the dynamics that people are talking about in terms of but the, the fact that we that some might never use the word performance to talk about Rick Lowe and might use it to talk about other projects seems to get troubled when you think about the fact that time and this the the extent to which you commit and the and the way that a certain kind of long term durationality also ends up implying a commitment to sp shared space. <laughs> um, uh, it ends up it ends up being that I think sometimes some of these sort of the these long term socially engaged art projects might have something to contribute to this this other discussion that we've been having that's a, that seem that on the performance in the art world. So it, it basically, it's, it, it it was brewing behind me that as I was think, thinking here, sitting in the audience, that something around the social so, sort of social practice discourse that doesn't always use this p word. Um, <laughs> it has something has, has something to do with um, what what you all been talking about. Oh, I'm so sorry because I actually didn't mean I meant to be you know in a in a in a loose and not fully coherent discussion uh, to be continuing that not at all to be having the last word, <laughs> but, and so I hope I won't. Um, and and maybe we'll. Uh, but I guess I do have to at least bring this to conclusion for a minute. Um, to uh, have uh, invite everyone to go out and get a, a, a bite to eat, uh, uh, to come back at one o'clock or before to be sure you have a seat, and uh, to uh, hope you'll stay with us for the rest of what we think will be a great day. Thanks.